It's June and doe deer and cow elk are starting to have their offspring here in Utah. Hey, I'm Adam Eagle and thanks for tuning in to KSL Outdoors. We've followed BYU grad students here to the book cliffs where they've got a study going on where they've collared a bunch of cow elk and doe deer and those uh, females now are having offspring. They're here to gather information, to try and figure out what's going on here in the books. So in a huge collaboration between the state of Utah and the DWR, lots of sportsman groups and BYU. And this one's good to go. And then you don't have to do this for calves, but you do have to do this for fawns because they're often twins. We have collared and put uh, vaginal implant transmitters in uh, a large number of deer and elk out here. We are researching mule deer and elk specifically relating to their parturition behavior. So that would have to deal with pregnancy rates and the timing of when they give birth, the um, resource selection of where they choose to give birth. And we're also monitoring survival of their offspring. So we're monitoring um, fawn survival, calf survival, and then we're looking at cause-specific mortality. Morgan, Matt, and Tabitha are graduate students at BYU's Wildlife Ecology Lab. The Book Cliffs is an extremely important unit for sportsmen, providing nearly one-third of the limited entry deer permits in the state. Here on the Book Cliffs, the elk population is stagnant and the deer herd is declining. We probably have about half the deer on the landscape we had in 2016. Um, and we've seen a real stagnation in our elk. We're struggling to get recruitment right now. A birth? Yeah. Oh, we have a birth. Sweet. These graduate students have been waiting for an email from this. It's called a VIT, or vaginal implant transmitter, that was inserted into doe mule deer and cow elk that were captured and collared last winter. We capture uh, adult females in the winter uh, and then we'll be able to check pregnancy just like with an ultrasound. But she's pregnant. Uh, and if an individual is pregnant, we insert this vaginal implant transmitter uh, in and that's able to stay uh, until birth where it's pushed out. Uh, and so we're able to get a, a pretty accurate estimate of the exact time that something uh, is born. The VIT sends a signal to the collar of the mother is wearing and the GPS collar sends an email to the students who then wait five hours for the mother to bond with the baby. This ensures there is no abandonment by the mother. Let's go catch a calf. They then go looking for the baby. In this case, a calf elk. Generally what we do is we send a team of maybe like three or four people in with the telemetry to find mom and we sneak in really quietly just like you're putting a stock on something like you were going to archery hunt that's our overall goal is to minimize impact and stress on these neonates oh look right there look do you see look. <laughs> that's a good sized cow once we get there, we'll take out our capture kit and what it has is we have a tape measure. We take some basic body measurements like hind leg length. We'll do a chest girth. We'll put the collar on and we'll also take a hair sample, which will be used for DNA and genetic testing. And then we will weigh it in the bag. So she's 41, which that's a big calf. So she's pretty healthy. And then all of those things, those measurements, we'll put them into models and combine them kind of with mom's condition, mom's age, and see if we can find any trends in, you know, do older cows have smaller calves or do prime aged cows have big calves or, you know, are the biggest calves born in the peak? Are the biggest calves born earlier or later? The information gathered from this calf and others just girth 57.5 will help these students and DWR managers understand what factors are limiting the elk herd on this unit? Help them discover why the population is stagnant. A little later, we'll dive into the health of Bookcliff's deer. She might have already jumped. She's not too close. So we'll just go check it out. Since 2014, the DWR, BYU, and their partners have collared over 4,000 deer in Utah. One of those deer just had a fawn. The students know this because they just received an email five hours ago. There she goes. Did you see her? Yeah, she had a collar. She came from down here. Let's just walk in quietly, nicely. 
This unit is one of three units the students have been conducting their research on. The others are the Monroe and the Cash units. Here on the Book Cliffs, the deer herd is really struggling. The Book Cliffs has a target deer population of 9,000 deer. In 2015, the herd was at 7,700. In 2019, it had dropped to 4,500. So what's going on? Why is the population declining? This unit out of all of our survival study units has the lowest fawn survival. We, I think about a month ago, were at 28%. It may have dropped another little percentage. So we're somewhere around 25% for yearling survival, which is really bad. In an ideal deal world, it would be awesome for six months old for us to see 70 to 80%, you know, 85% even. That would be awesome and that would definitely help a population a lot more. So 25 is, that's rough. You know, we realized we had population level issues on, on the book cliffs. And, and whenever we do that, you look at what the drivers of the population are, right? It's adult female survival coupled with fawn recruitment. And so the only way to get at that is to have a really intensive study. No, it's for real. It's for real. Here's a fawn. We'll make sure there's not a twin somewhere in here. We're lucky enough to have some really great partners at BYU. Um, some great professors over there, and I feel like I should give kudos to both Randy Larson and Brock and Dylan. So we're putting that zero collar on. Great partners with great grad students. And we've been able to partner with them, design a study to follow these animals, look at what their survival rates are, and then look at what the causes of death are. And if we can determine that, I mean, th those are, Adam, those are real management actions, right? You determine what's killing things. You can say, okay, we address this, this, and this. Our survival is going to increase, and, and we'll end up with more animals on the landscape. One thing that has revolutionized this project and how these students conduct their research is technology. Just a few years ago, GPS technology wasn't available to these students. Technology has improved so much since then. We now have really fine scale GPS data coming in, whereas before, you know, you had to wake up every morning and go out and listen. So now all we have to do is kind of sit down at our computer and upload the points. Um, we also have this really cool new technology where callers can talk to each other, um, mom's caller can talk to fawn, the fawn's caller, and also talk to the vaginal implant transmitter, and it's made our lives so much easier. It's made it so that we can catch more animals with less manpower. This is very official scientific research gear. This is um, $2 pillowcases from Walmart. What's a good weight for these? For a single, 3.8 to 4. So 3.5, 3.6, okay. That's still a good weight for a single, but we'll still go look for a twin. But if not, that's an appropriate weight. It's dead. So we are now just gonna hike out to this potential mortality and check it out. Hopefully give a reason behind it, a cause-specific mortality, and uh, do our little CSI investigation. Welcome back to the Book Cliffs. A large part of this study is tracking the survival of the fawns and calves that have been collared. The students received an alert this morning, letting them know they have a dead calf and a dead fawn that were both collared just days ago. Oh, it's right here. Mmm, this one's gonna be tricky. This calf has died next to a fence, but there's no sign of predation, and now the students must try and determine what killed it. We start looking for signs of uh, predation or otherwise. In this case, it seems like a, a non-predation death and just see what clues that, that we can get from this to determine mortality. Mm, it does have scrapes on its legs and, it, and blood, so maybe it caught itself on the fence. Let's take a picture. The students do a quick in-the-field necropsy and move on to the dead fawn. Keep an eye out, we should be pretty close. Got it. Got it? Yeah. Once again, it's a whole carcass death. This year on the Book Cliffs, the students have collared 25 fawns and 14 of those have died. Eight of the 14 have died from an unknown cause. This is a weird year though. We've had a lot of deer just tip over. And we've also had extreme temperatures. And so you start to ask yourself, like, I go through the list of diseases that occur when there's drought and higher stress. And I say, okay, how does that affect neonates? The next thing I go to is, all right, they're little. Are they, are they struggling to regulate body temperature? The temperature today is hovering around 90 degrees, unseasonably warm. Is it just too hot for these fawns? 
There's also a lot of mouths to feed on the book cliffs. There's deer, elk, feral horses, bison, cattle, even pronghorn. With the current drought, is it possible that the book cliffs is at or near capacity? No, I think of carrying capacity like a bucket. But the problem with the bucket is our bucket changes size depending upon how much moisture is in the ground. You know, if we have more water, we might have a 10 gallon bucket and we can hold 10 gallon worth of whatever the animal might be. But when we end up in a year like this, the bucket shrinks to five gallons. Drought and climatic is another big, big driver. You know, and there are things we can do. I don't want to sound doom and gloom. You know, one of the things we can do is we can look at what take is and see if what predators or what things are having the, the biggest impact. And if we can identify and say, okay, in the book list, X percent are killed by lions, X percent are killed by bears, um, we can come back and say, all right, do we need to adjust take on lions or bears to account for that and push those populations back while we allow deer or elk to recover? There is so many questions, and that is why this study is so important for not just the DWR, but us as sportsmen, to try and find the answers to why the deer population is declining on the book cliffs. You really couldn't do this without your partners. Oh, not at all. We owe huge thanks to them for the funding, for the help on the ground, and for their, their support as well as we ask for funding and as we design and carry out these big projects we have a lot of backing and support from them which we really appreciate. They need them. I know there's a lot of you know even myself and viewers out there that are a little skeptical of conservation organizations and I would just maybe tell you this you're gonna get more change from the inside than you are from chirping on the outside so get involved with some of these organizations and make some change inside if you want to see more programs like this man keep contributing. Hey I'm Adam Eco KSL Outdoors reminding you with your family your friends come out to the book cliffs Make some memories outdoors. We'll see you next weekend. Good night.